What is up? What is up? Happy Monday. It is June 15th. Welcome to episode three of the Deets with Dr. A. Welcome. I'm Dr. A. So welcome to the Learning Liaisons. This is a new live streaming PD alternative for you. Very engaging. We have got topics across the board, everything for education, for teachers, parents, school leaders, heck, anybody out there that wants to learn about the field of education. And more importantly, how we can support teachers, support parents, and more importantly, the bottom line, to support our students. So we have got an amazing episode for you here tonight. But first, I want to bring on uh, our main man, our executive producer, Matt. Let's throw a big welcome to Matt. Matt, you want to jump on? How are we doing today, Matt? Are we ready to roll? Uh, I think so. I think we're ready. All right. All right. So let's do this real quick before we bring on our special guest here today. Let's throw up our next next week's episode real quick because I know we'll we'll forget that at the end. We've got every Monday night at 6 p.m. Uh, so next week, we're going to throw that up on the screen. We are going to talk about how to virtually engage our students in the new normal. We don't know what's going to happen when schools open up across the United States, but we do know there's going to be some form of distance learning. We have got a rock every week. We got rock star educators and leaders. We've got a rock star leader uh, teacher for you next week. Chris is going to be joining us, uh, and we're excited to have him here next week on next Monday at 6 p.m. for episode four of Deeds with Dr. A. So, without further ado, what we're going to do here is we're going to bring on our special guest here today, and this is a gentleman that I've known for years as a friend, as a colleague. Um, he is located in the great state of Pennsylvania, right outside Philadelphia. And let's bring on our special guest here, Dr. Claudio Cerullo. Welcome, Dr. Cerullo. I call you Claudio here. Thank you for joining us. And we have got an amazing episode here tonight. We're gonna to talk about bullying and more importantly, cyberbullying. So before we jump into some discussion questions and questions from the crowd, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Talk a little bit about yourself. You're, your experiences, what you do in education, your nonprofit. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, man. Listen, I, I'm, I'm grateful to be on your show. I, I, I have great respect for you and thank you for having me as a guest. Uh, and you know how passionate I am about this topic, uh, not only from a uh, personal experience, but certainly from having uh, been in education at many levels for many years. And 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 why, why this topic is so uh, important to discuss uh, with our educators and, and parents and certainly students is because it's such a growing, ever growing pervasive public health issue. And when we're talking about the virtual world and we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, education and rigor, th th you can't learn if you don't feel safe in any school, uh, school community in America. Um, from my perspective, I, this is my 26th year in education. I started out as a social science teacher. And uh, I want to say on that note, as a teacher, I, I never, I never forget forgot that I was a teacher. And for many of you who are educators out there, uh, or if you go on the higher ed or you're an administrator like I did at, at the elementary, middle and high school level, uh, I never forgot to support our teachers. They are the backbone uh, of any school in any district across the United States and around the world. And quite frankly, right now, as you know, in this growing pandemic, their, their job was hard prior. It's even yeah. more difficult uh, today and trying to, to help students navigate through the many uncertainties of education and learning in any content area. Uh, and certainly in a classroom, whether now virtual or brick and mortar, you know, they, they just have one responsibility and that is to help support their kids uh, in, in, in the classroom and certainly uh, on the playing field or in the playgrounds and uh, we're always found that an issue of bullying or cyber bullying arises and the question is what, what do we do how do we handle it I've spent many years as an administrator in fact over the last 10 years I was a high school principal in one of the most trying cities in America in Camden New Jersey it was one of known as one of the most violent cities in 2014 uh, but I turned around a failing high school uh, to a successful state and uh, I've been in higher education. And then roughly in 2011, in the fall, Dr. A, we started and launched teachantibullying.org. Uh, teachantibullying.org is a 501c3 nonprofit based here in the Delaware Valley region. Uh, we are surrounded by Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. We have traveled throughout the United States in 33 states. We have spoken to over 103,000 kids, uh, over 30,000 teachers and parents. And the goal and the mission of this organization truly is to help support the professional development efforts uh, so that teachers truly understand what bullying is, what it is not, and certainly the intervention and preventative strategies so that they can do what they are hired to do, and that is to teach our kids. 
uh, and, you know, certainly look at some of the behavioral aspects. And, and the other piece of the puzzle is the school assembly piece, working with uh, parents, local law enforcement officials, really to bring everyone together. And, and certainly, as you're seeing now in this world of, of social justice, you know, bullying is the same, you know, platform. We're talking about perpetrators. We're talking about uh, the victims. We're talking about bystanders. Uh, and they're all part of this same umbrella. Um, so... Yeah. You said something real, real powerful. You said a lot of powerful things so far. We just started, but you said something really that runs true just to education in general, the whole idea of being safe and secure in your classroom. Right. So that goes back to the whole Maslow's hierarchy needs, the whole feeling of being safe. And as educators, if you're a teacher watching this, whether you're watching live with us or you're watching the recording on a YouTube channel, you know, just like anything else, if the kids don't feel safe, there's no right. learning that's going to be happening in the classroom. So this is a major component of the safety, whatever, I don't care if it's kindergarten through high school, even at the collegiate level. So we're excited to have you, Claudio. So what we're gonna do here tonight, just like we do each week, ladies and gentlemen, is we got a series of discussion questions. So we've got some of a format, but this is kind of off the cuff things. We'll have discussions. If you're watching, whether you're watching the recording or live, definitely right now, if you have any questions or things about what Dr. Cerullo is saying or an experience that you have or something you wanna to add to the conversation, throw it in the chat box. And also, please make sure if you're watching live, if you're watching on your smartphone, take a quick snapshot of your of your smartphone device, a screenshot, and post that on your social media and tag some teachers and parents. Or if you're watching the recording, grab that URL off the top of the screen and share it on your social media because we are providing this training, this engaging opportunity for you guys to help out and provide that support and motivation we need for our teachers and leaders and our parents as well. So we got a couple of, uh, of of discussion questions. We're going to start off easy and then yeah. work our way up a little hard. So I think, and I'm sure Dr. Srulo can add to this and concur that it's real important we need to define this first. So Dr. Srulo, how would you define bullying and then cyberbullying? Just you know, so that everybody understand. Dr. A, if you were teaching your educational foundations 101 class, and, and certainly this particular course now is embedded in, in most higher ed universities or post-secondary universities. And uh, if this was day one, it, this is the appropriate you know, starting point. And so it may mean many things to very different people, and it depends on your ethnic or racial background. Mm -hmm. uh, but we look at the defi definition truly of bullying is it's going to be three operative words. And if you learn nothing else, you remember that it is an imbalance of power. So, so that imbalance of power, that bully or bullies is going to focus on two domains of one's person, the psyche and certainly that physical. So when we start off at the physical and whether it's pre-K or you're going to 12th grade or post-secondary or even the workplace is looking at taking someone's personal possession, causing harm uh, upon that particular person. And that harm might be certainly, uh, you know, fist to cuff where someone is getting hurt every day, whether it's in a hallway, a cafeteria, in unsupervised areas like the locker room or playing fields, uh, taking someone's personal property, whether it's their iPhone, backpacks, uh, I, you know, uh, Jordan sneakers, whatever is a value on, on a continual basis. And I'm going to add to that definition. Then when we look at the, the psychological or emotional aspects of bullying, we look at that, you know, extracting that person from the school community, you know, leaving them left out, uh, that cyber world, there's, there's going to be many other variables of the definition of bullying mm -hmm. itself. Now, here's where people often say, well, a teacher's going to say, you know, my student's getting bullied or a parent says, you know, to the principal or superintendent, uh, my child is being bullied. Unbeknownst to them, you know, they're, they're often confused between bullying and when it's a school related conflict. And there is a distinct yeah. different there, difference there. And that is that there has to be a clear criteria from, from a psychological perspective. That is, we look at the frequency, the duration, the, in the power base, uh, of how long of these particular incidents occurring, whether it's, you know, in the classroom or in the school building. So is it the, during the course of, of, of a day? Does it progress to the course of a week? Does it progress over the weekend and come back Monday morning? Is it over a month? You know, we, we've dealt with thousands upon case studies and they vary from the school boss to the classroom, to hallways, uh, to the playing fields. But that criteria of that imbalance of power, that that uh, that progression of frequency and duration, and that intensity ha have to be in place 
for someone to say, we, we have a clear case of bullying. And, and the other side effect of this, Dr. A, is every state, roughly 33 states in the country do have bullying, anti-bullying and cyberbullying laws, legislation, real legislation, like I was fortunate to serve uh, on Governor Christie's task force in New Jersey. And in Pennsylvania, where I live, we do not have legislation. I am trying to fight for legislation uh, here in PA, and we're still fighting to get it to protect children. Uh, but, you know, w without those criteria, you really just have isolated pockets of incidences that we then have to look at some of the behavioral aspects. But clearly, mm -hmm. if something rises to those uh, three or four elements, you, you have a bullying situation. And you're responsible uh -huh. as an educator, as a teacher, uh, or rather as an educator, as a teacher, as a school administrator on being able to effectively mitigate those. Part of the challenges, Jason, as you know, um, you know, most students, they go to a teacher ed class, they take a class of classroom management, and they say, my God, it's overwhelming. I have to deal with behavior. I have mm -hmm. to deal with bullying. I, all I want to do is teach. And in certain, you know, school districts around the country, some are most, more challenging than others. And they don't really know the issue at hand and then how to basically resolve it. So there's a lot of variables to it. From a cyberbullying perspective, and as we're going to get into in this show, it's a little bit more of the pervasive and more of the concerns from, from my end uh, as an educator, as an expert, and certainly as a parent. Uh, but that is how we define it clearly. And, and when we get into cyber, that takes on a whole nother world of its own. So do you feel that some people might get confused the definition between bullying and something like harassment? Or would you tell people that's kind of similar? It, no, no. So, so hara it's interesting because when we look at harassment, mm -hmm. child molestation, child abuse, um elderly victimization we look at domestic violence they all have the same elements and criteria mm -hmm. of someone being a victim when mm -hmm. we look at even what's happening with george floyd and what happened with george floyd from a social justice standpoint mm -hmm. that man was a, a again a victim perhaps some have said and i've gotten calls well wasn't he bullied by the police officers Yes and no. Did they have elements of, of, of three other officers standing idle as bystanders? Yes. Mm. But repeatedly, that man was not a target. But these are often where when we say, why aren't there interventions? Why aren't there you know, people stepping in? It does take on harassment, assault. But again, within the same criteria of someone saying, I'm picking on that same person over time, you know, and I use myself as an example, and I was an immigrant, Italian immigrant uh, to this uh, country in 74. And in part, because of my ethnic background as an Italian, I was called a guinea, a dago, a wop, which are all racial slurs uh, based on my ethnicity and my racial, my, my, my ethnic background. And, and that is often how when we look at, well, I'm being harassed, and they are other forms, defamation, libel, slander, if they fall within the context of repeated actions. And when and, and, and Dr. A, you're absolutely right. When we look at harassment, we don't use harassment so much in the, in the pre-K-12, P-16, but we will use that in, in higher ed. We will use that in the workplace. And you might be on a job as a teacher, maybe you're harassed every day by your supervisor or your principal, or, you know, you work at wherever you work. And that harassment takes the place as I'm being victimized within the same confines of, of being bullied. But we may not use that among the adult community. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So we, we got another question on the screen. Here. So do you think online bullying is worse than or not as bad as physical bullying? Well, because right? I, I know from listening to teachers and sometimes parents and the, everybody understands this is a serious topic, but you, I'm sure you could agree. There are some people out there that think, well, you know, it's online. It's not like you're picking on somebody face to face. But we know there's still the emotional and psychological and physical damage that's happening. So what would you say to someone that do you think it's worse or not as bad? So you so you and I, you know, are roughly the same age and we, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have uh, the Internet. You know, people would would may fight you. They will hurt you. I certainly was was affected. Um, they could say things about you and, you know, no one knew much about it. And when in the days of newspapers, it was used for simply, uh, you know, 
collecting, uh, you know, whatever. Today, the internet is certainly much more of a powerful tool of self-destruction and destroying mm -hmm. someone else's life on many levels. And when we look at uh, the percentages, roughly, you know, 25 to 40 percent of our teens right now uh, are hurting each other on in a cyber world. Yeah. Using multiple levels of platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, uh, you know, Twitter, and it's and it's every day, and it and it recurs, and then they recreate, and then they go under an alias, and then they create a finsta, and, and there's multiple layers, and many of the the complaints and and concerns that we get come from the cyber world. Certainly, when we look at physical, you know, an altercation occurs, someone gets picked on, you know, there is some mitigation there. It's a little bit more difficult in the cyber world, and then the question becomes, when do I uh, involve law enforcement. You know, mm -hmm. why can't my school principal or my teacher help me, you know, after hours? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of, when we look at the civil and the criminality of it, it's very difficult. And, and it's difficult because in an education community, administrators can only do so much after yeah. the hours and certainly over the weekend. And this is where, you know, we tell uh, uh, parents and even educators and law enforcement, those who work with kids, you still have to be proactive and vigilant because it will come back to your school, community, and classroom on Monday morning. I just, I just think about when I was when I was growing up through middle school and high school. There, when you went home, you went home. Mm -hmm. But now, when you go home, it doesn't end. You know, the, the emails and the social media and everything. So, kids who kids who are, are suffering this on a daily basis, they can't escape it like back in the day. You know, everybody had that person. I remember there, there was a, a man, a man, a kid when I was in middle school and high school, he used to pick on everybody. He picked on me too. And I was a little kid back then. But when I went home, whatever, you know, it is what it is. He lived nowhere near me. But nowadays you can't hide from that. So, you know, it's something that as teachers and especially as parents and guardians, you know, we, we, we care about our kids, Correct. right? I'm sure they do, but how do we, and we'll get into that a little bit. How do you you know, how do you understand if your kid is susceptible to this? Is there something going on? What do you do about it? So we'll we'll get to that here shortly. So we throw we'll roll on with the next discussion question on the screen is what responsibilities do social media networks have towards cyberbullying? So well, I don't know about this. Maybe you do. I mean, is there you know there are lawsuits that can any 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 recourse that parents or kids have with this? What do you what do you, you know, think about Mark Zuckerberg and, and certainly connecting Facebook and Instagram have done a very nice job of providing those safeguards. And you know it's just like when we look at the parental guidelines on a TV. You know it's the parents' responsibility. And you know Dr. A, your 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 son now is how old? Two. Two. No, he's going to be eleven months soon. Eleven months. <laughs> I'm not even two. Wow, he just looks really, really big as a child. So I, I, I say to myself, I think about your little boy, and, uh, and where will that, where will technology be when he enters that realm of 13 years of age and he, and he starts sixth, seventh, and eighth grade? Yeah. It's very scary. It's scary for us as teens. We have three teens, but it is a re inherent responsibility of of any. You know, whether it's Twitter and Twitter and again, Instagram and certainly Facebook have done a very nice job uh, holding kids accountable when they are violating community standards and the policies as such. And they, and they really help uh, to interface with law enforcement when a potential crime has existed. And these crimes, you know, have to law enforcement and social media have to play an intricate role. And I'll, and I'll give you a perfect example, as I was illustrating before the show took place. My daughter, who is 16 years old, that she's going into her junior year of high school, was victim last week. We were walking around the mall after it opened up and she got a uh, she got a um, uh, Snapchat message saying you know, she was very emotional about it. And, 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 it, and it turned out uh, that she was going to be victimized. And, and as it progressed without kind of belaboring the story, it turned out to be over 27 young ladies within four different counties that were being targeted. And this was on Snapchat. Now, she fortunately took the messages and took screenshots of each of those messages um, of this perpetrator, you know, and we did interface with Snapchat. And, and, and the local, our local law enforcement department did have to file a subpoena where they then released all of the messages uh, from the server uh, to help locate where this these messages were coming from. Now, what's interesting, and this is a kind of a transition into what we're talking about here, it turned out that when they tracked where these messages were coming from, when you sign up to Snapchat, you have to give them an email address. 
-hmm. And it turned out that uh, when they went to the suspect or who they thought this kid was, um, it turned out that they could not prove that it was him because the email did not match his IP address because it was from an app called 10 Minute Email. So you create it and after 10 minutes, you can affect whoever you want, predominantly through Snapchat, and then the email disappears. So there's no trace. So after after this time of investigation, we could not prove that this particular young man that we we really truly think you know was the one doing this to over 27 young ladies to have them expose themselves uh, for some type of money. Uh, you know, we could not track them down and the local detectives and the state police couldn't do much of that. But but I can tell you that when we look at that partnership between law enforcement and if a crime arises, uh, most of your 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 uh, social media platforms do cooperate, especially if there's a crime there. Uh, I think the key is that as an educator and parents, if a student comes to you and and he or she says I'm being victimized, you have to take them to some of the protocol of blocking that person. You know, and again, when we look at the safeguards, you don't, you never engage. If it is a Snapchat, you know, within 10 seconds, it does disappear. It does alert if you take a screenshot. So I always tell our own children, take, take, take another phone, your parents' phone or your brother's, take the a photo of all of those particular texts so that you can use those if there is a criminal act there of harassment. Uh, against you or some type of victim. I remember I've, I've had the opportunity to watch you do live sessions in another state. And then we had you come down to one of the universities years ago. And I'll never forget was when you asked the question you posed to the group is that, you know, when when a child gets bullying, like, for example, test, text messages or something sent to them, yeah. what do you think the first thing that a kid Correct. does is they delete it. So, exactly. you know, you got it. You got to keep that stuff. Well, and that is the problem. And, and it is instinctual from, a, from an involuntary state. You know, I, I see something and someone says, I'm going to hurt you. Or I'm going to affect your life in some way. You know, impulsivity wise, we're going to say, I, I have to get rid of this right away. Some kids, unfortunately, they're going to retaliate and they start a text war back. You, you don't want to do that. You don't need to engage. You simply want to take a photo of that screenshot, preserve that. Certainly, it's a lot easier when we're dealing with emails. Uh, and tracking it from an IP address, but but from a Snapchat and most of our kids, my three and in, including, they they that's all that's the only way they communicate with one another. They don't really go through Messenger, you know. It's all Snapchat. Yeah, and you guys are wa watching live, or you watching this recording? If you have any experience, personal experience with either your child or yourself growing up, feel free to throw those in the comment box. We're we're here to help provide the support that you need and the guidance you need. So we've got another question up on the screen for Dr. Cerullo. Can you think of a few examples of cyberbullying uh, well, to share with people? When we talk about, you know, the question's always, when we look at gadgets today, mm -hmm. and these gadgets have certainly evolved from, you know, the last 10 years. Even mm -hmm. looking at the iPhone, I mean, you know, to an iPad or a computer, where does it start? Uh, and it starts with some form of technology, you know, and, and kids are very smart and they're only going to get smarter and they're able to figure things out. And they typically stay away from the computer in terms of affecting someone's life because they know there's more of a trace there and they're not stupid. So they are very bright and savvy about that. So they're going to go to some app in order to hurt someone. And, and part of when we look at cyberbullying and why it occurs, it occurs in part because many you know, young kids think I can get away with it and I can hide behind some alias or some Finsta or you know, some downloaded app that I can just shelter behind it and no one will figure out what I'm doing. Uh, the, the, the challenge behind that is there's also a lot of predator apps and I, I believe that you may have a- uh, Yeah, Matt, uh, that's probably a good time, Matt. You wanna throw up one of those? Yeah, we got a couple of them. You maybe wanna talk real quick, sure. walk people through some of these. I talk about this is something when we do professional development across the state, across the country, and certainly in Pennsylvania, I want teachers and parents to be aware of the predator apps. These predator apps are cyber bullying crimes. When we look at uh, apps like Kick, Tinder, and Snapchat, uh, that is not the real, it looks just like the icon of the, of the regular Snapchat app. But when you look at, and I explain, these are apps that affect someone's life in some way. And the three that are on the screen now, the one that you need to play, pay close attention to is that Snapchat that looks just like the Snapchat that may be on your child's phone. 
in this particular one, it's self-destructive photos. So kids can hide what's called snap porn behind it, and it can be revenge porn. So typically a kid will take photos of someone, typically girls, and they will hide that. And most parents won't even know what's behind that, and they will uh, uh, keep them as a storage uh, vault. The problem with that is that you have now committed a crime of, of child pornography if you disseminate those photos out to various phones uh, through the app, uh, mm -hmm. then you have another crime and that's the dem dissemination of child pornography. Uh, you look at Tinder, it's a dating app that allows users to rate profiles and, and look at local hookups. A lot of sexual assaults occur using Tinder. There is also a GPS tracking that opens doors for predators. Uh, Kick allows the potential predators to communicate anonymously with children. Why I tell you they're all predators at because my daughter, I recall, and she was an eighth grader. She had a friend or thought she had a friend without meeting the friend through uh, an app. And this app, I'm going to tell you what it was. It was called at the time it, they, she thought she was playing a game called Naked Pool, P-O-O-L, Naked Pool. It was simply just supposed to be a fun game. It turns out that my daughter came to me and said, Dad, this person is sending me, you know, sexually explicit photos. I didn't. And she said, I did not respond. Lo and behold, again, uh, she did not know that she was communicating uh, with a person that was 42 year old predator locally in my township. He was, in fact, arrested. But these apps are again, that's why we call them predator app. They act as lures. And one again, some of you teachers who are special educators, uh, I do have a child on the spectrum. Uh, he is high functioning Asperger's. But, you know, I tell people the one thing a child on the spectrum wants, and many of you who work with special needs children, uh, they want that social acceptance. So they become a, a very clear target, a very easy target for luring them into the cyber world. It's just like, hey, coach, you're my friend. Hey, pastor, you're my friend. You, what you think may be a teacher or school administrator may in fact be a sexual predator. And so that's why it's very important to be very documentative about whatever you do, what your children tell you, and you're responsible then to communicate that with district officials because again even if it's during the day or on the weekends or on, on after hours believe me at least you can have a paper trail and some documentation because it will not go away it doesn't just end like that it will mm. resurface and so as, as much ammunition and documentation you have if a potential crime does exist for your local or state you know a police department they will need that information and the first thing they do uh, when my daughter printed out the eight pages of those snap uh, transmission, they looked for a crime and there was a crime there because the perpetrator asked her among 27 other females to expose themselves. Now that is the crime uh, in nature. Before we roll, before Matt, before you throw on the next one with the different apps, throw that first one back on again because I want, I know, I know you said it, Dr. Shula, but yeah. when everyone, when they're watching this recording to understand that snapshot, snapshot, snapshot. <laughs> Long yep. day already. Snapchat. We're not talking about the traditional Snapchat. Right. Act. This is a version of it. That is right. And parents and teachers might think it's Snapchat, but it's really not. That's right. OK, and I just want everyone to understand that. So, it, And Matt, I don't know if you have the screenshot of the one I want to share. Is It's called High Calculators. The High Calculator there. There you go. So parents, teachers. Uh, school officials, I want you to look at the high calculator. And, and, and again, I would hold up my cell phone, but that looks just like the same app that you, if you go to your cell phone, it looks just like the calculator. It is a fictitious uh, uh, backdrop. Uh, students will download that and the, and the uh, assets behind the high calculator, it allows us, allows kids to hide photos, most pornographic photos, sexually explicit photos, videos and messages so that they can take it from there and then dispense it out in the cyber world. Uh, most parents would not know the difference unless you really are looking at or paying close attention to your children's uh, uh, techno technological devices. The same thing with Volti, you know, it snaps photos to anyone trying to access Volti with wrong passwords, intending to hide information. These are all current apps are all being used uh, by kids beginning at the young age of, of, of 12 all the way into adult world. And, and, and again, they are very deceptive to the naked eye and to parents and certainly to educators. And uh, they're used in school during school hours and no one would know the same. Same thing with Audio Manager. It is a deceptive audio app. Uh, that allows uh, you to hide media, uh, 
uh, uh, photos and videos in a lock screen and no one would know the same. It just, and if somebody asked, you just simply say it's another music app like Musical.ly or, you know, uh, iTunes. Awesome. All right. So let's see what we got here. Uh, here's a good question, a good discussion question for you. Do cyberbully victims and perpetrators fit? A, is there a certain ter a stereotypical profile for you someone know, who's a, a bully? Well, the oh, we got frozen on Dr. Cerullo there. Hold on a second. Uh, see if we get. <laughs> well, look at that. He's frozen on us. Uh, let's see here. Let's get all the memory real quick. Looks like his, you lost you. You got to hold on. We'll get him back in here in one second. So if you guys are, are watching with us, that was to get Dr. Cerullo back up on the screen. Go ahead and uh, go ahead and share in the comments if you've ever been a victim of bullying or had any experience with your child or maybe kids in your classroom. Uh, we love to hear the experiences. We're here to help. We're here to provide that support. So whether you're watching live or watching the recording on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page, go ahead and share. Share your experiences because as educators, we all know it's about self-reflection and growth. So you might be a kindergarten, fifth grade teacher, high school teacher, and maybe you're aware of cyberbullying, what to look for, but there's always room to grow and to learn new things. And here at The Learning Liaisons, we're here to help you provide that support and that growth. That's why we're bringing on experts in the field like, the, like Dr. Cerullo. Uh, who's coming back in the classroom right here right now so we're here for you feel free to post any questions while we're getting them back in the uh get the, in the classroom if you have any questions for dr cerullo go ahead and put those in the comment box uh or on the recording there we go we got him back there we lost you for a second i'm not sure what happened oh, you're Technology. good you're good when it works it works <laughs> uh let's throw that back on we're about to talk about this yeah. So, Dr. A, when, when we look at the stereotypical profile, someone who is a cyber bullying, you, again, you, you have to look at the spectrum and it, it's no dis difference if somebody's physically bullying you or cyber bullying you. When we, I just want to make the distinction that typically on the physical side, boys are more fist to cuff at roughly 37 percent. Uh, the sad part is the females, 57% are more of your cyber bullies. And why is that? It's simply because they're more social in nature. And more of when we look at um, the infrastructure of when kids impart and impact somebody else, they do it online from cyber realm. And, and girls, unfortunately, do it much more uh, prevalent than boys. Uh, there is no real stereotypical profile. They are going to come after someone who is more of an introverted person, someone who perhaps is not well liked or, or very popular, uh, someone who is more sometimes academic, someone who reaches or is more ethnic and racial uh, in terms of, uh, you know, wanting to target someone who does not, you know, meet that mainstream. Uh, someone who perhaps on a sports team that is not the best athlete or the smartest person in the classroom more that weaker kid and they will isolate them. And just like the movie Mean Girl, they will try in some way, shape or form to embarrass them. Uh, and most recently, if, you, if you've seen the movie on Netflix, Fantasy Island, uh, mm -hmm. the one person's fantasy in, in the movie was to get back at her, her, at her bully uh, that uh, victimized her while in high school. You know, it happens all the time. I think uh, part of the concern for us is that uh, right now teen suicide is the second leading cause of death, predominantly to cyberbullying incidences in this country. And this just came out by the Center for Disease Control uh, last October. Uh, so they don't fit into anything. It's more looking at someone who does uh, stand out in a community. You know, I, I don't personally think these kids uh, are mean kids. I, I think they have some related issues that they want to impart that imbalance of power on someone who is weaker or less fortunate. Um, Do you and think a part of it could be the whole social learning aspect of yeah. seeing someone in their family or in their life? doing this and kind of recreating that? I mean, you think that, I know that falls into the realm of education and learning and how people behave, but when it comes to bullying, do you feel that there's a, a percentage of kids who do that just because they see it at home and things that they witness in their everyday life? So when we look at someone, you know, you, the question that's always asked is, why does someone bully? Well, how, how did they become a bully? And I believe that any child born, you know, is inherently a good child and everyone is part of their environment and, and you know, their upbringing. 
and it is what they witness. And if you look at a lot of times and, you know, we say this and some of you teachers and I know your parents as well, when your children play sports, you are that role model and, and what you, you know, share and show your children. If you're showing those positive ways of dealing with behavior and, and being in good sportsmanship, then your children should model that. Unfortunately, as a parent and, and Dr. A, as a new parent, the challenge is making sure that there's a level of protection. And where I'm always fearful is we are battling this world of social media and where children, unfortunately, the parent is not as strong as he or she used to be in breaking bread around the table. We were inundated by what kids see on YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing how much leverage they have over the parent. And when you try to, you know, say, hey, that's enough, they're still doing it with their friends outside of it. And I, 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 I stroll on the boardwalk last weekend at the New Jersey Shore, and all I hear is ridicule. And, oh, did you see this person? And I see them go right to the Snapchat, and they send out the video, and they're making videos, and they're making fun. And, you know, in part, you can step in, but you could be potentially outnumbered, and you don't want problems. But you mm -hmm. see it all the time it's constant ridicule um you know and 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 the question you have up here now is how does it affect someone's life well in many ways and certainly in two ways you know people who are victimized as a bully uh we look at the research and they'll either end up hurting themselves which is really more of the tragic realm that we're dealing with now in this country from a cyber standpoint or affecting harm on a school community uh, I'm just now finishing a book I'm writing called the inside the mind of a bully. And we're and the chapter we just finished was looking at active school shooters and the, the research is, is about 60, 40. And, and we know in many cases, someone who has been victimized uh, like Adam Lanza, you know, Michael Cornell, some of these folks who have been shooters, certainly you're no stranger in Orlando of what's happened many times across the spectrum there. Um, you know, they have been victimized. And, and, and as humans, we, we reach a threshold without intervention and mental health support to take that aggression out on someone. And, and again, in a school community, while a teacher is assigned to teach ELA, mathematics uh, or social studies, it's very challenging because they don't know what's happening in their home, whatever county in Florida, whether it's Dade County or, you know, wherever it is, they're facing a lot of trauma. And so, uh, and I want to also kind of say this session is about bullying, but it's also looking at trauma informed care, social and emotional learning. It's looking at restorative justices practices. We, we can't just simply say, you're out, we're going to suspend you and give you a detention. We, we have to look at many of these kids who are being victimized. And you have to say, well, yes, we, we worry about the victim, but the bully inherently has some mental health related issue. There's some underlining trauma that we have to address. And this is where a teacher may say, well, I don't get paid enough for this. Send them to the child study team or a child psychologist or vice principal, but we're all accountable. Yeah. It's not just teaching. It's not just taking the practice as you know, and I'm preaching to the choir with you, Dr. A, but, but this is a, this is a, 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 you talk about raising a child, it takes a village, this takes an, an, a village beyond the village to help this issue because at the end of the day, you just want to teach. You want to make children to make sure children are safe and they look good and they feel good, but they're impacted outside of a world that we can't imagine. Those who don't eat. I was in a very impoverished school. I had to make sure they were incentivized to come to school. The violence in an inherent drug infested city, gangs, you know, kids who are saying, you want me to learn? I got to help my mama pay the bills. My father's incarcerated. I mean, there's so many other variables, which again, that's a whole nother segment, Dr. A, but it all perils when you're talking about why does someone bully? They're, they're not bad kids, man. They, they, they need some support, you know, and, and oftentimes there's, there's not two parents there. They're being raised by a guardian, an uncle, someone, and so, you know, education's taken on a whole nother world today, especially. Hey, are, you try, are you trying to tell me that a teacher's job is not just teaching content? That you we know, it, other it, 
that's sarcasm coming through. I don't think teachers get paid enough money. No, they I don't. don't think they get paid enough money. No, and we're part, part psychiatrist, part it's unbelievable. And we're part everything. If I, I had the authority to give teachers raises, honest to goodness, they a minimum starting salary for a teacher should be one hundred and three thousand dollars a year just to start. And then, you know, you can go up at a, at a pay scale, you know, every three, whatever yes. years, but and they don't get paid enough money. And, you know, it's and, interesting. <laughs> and if you believe that teachers should start off at a hundred grand, I want you to like this video right now it's, on YouTube it's a shame. as it's you're a watching shame. this recording. <laughs> it's a shame. You know, what's sad to me? I remember my brother who was an architect, he would say, oh, your job is so easy. You're a teacher. You get the summers off. They have no idea. Those who do not teach or were never a teacher, how difficult it is. And that's why, and I say this, I'm saying, I'm putting myself, never forget, for those of you who are principal, superintendent, school board members, never forget you were a teacher. Because you, you in, in order, if you forgot that, you, you should not even be in education because their job is very, very difficult day in and day out working. With, and now, now, my God, I, I've talked to teachers, I'm sure you have too, Dr. A. They've never had a more difficult semester, this, this from oh, March. Yeah. 13th the day today and they said my god i've never worked so hard in my life from a virtual you know standpoint um mm -hmm. to try to help children to try to even you know give them a sense of some type of direct instruction and it's been very challenging and i see it even at home with my kids yeah adriana shared the the starting salary in in Broward county florida is forty one thousand dollars shameful i, I don't that's, that's poverty that's that's a poverty salary for someone probably with a master's degree or master's plus 30. it is sad it is sad that that my son the other day said to me oh you know i would like to be this and i would like to be that i said well how do you think the neurosurgeon got there how do you think the lawyer got there he or she went through the pre-k 12 system and somebody taught that person who's now a supreme court justice president of the united states or or or, or an astronaut and it all started with your teacher so it's sad that it's tax based, tax based but they need to figure out how to, how to raise these salaries for teachers because they are the backbone of, of, of America, in my opinion, because it all starts with that kindergarten day. Uh -huh. well, definitely, definitely agree with you 110% there. So let's turn a little bit towards parents, because I know we have a lot of teachers that are going to watch this on YouTube and joining us here a lot. But we also have pe teachers that are parents and maybe just parents who are going to watch this as well. Yeah. So what can parents do? Because this is something that I get from teachers saying sure. and parents like, how are we supposed to know? What do we do? Yeah. Like what can parents do to protect their kids? Is it possible to protect them from cyber cyberbullying? So what what can you share with our parents who are watching this? So, so Dr. A, your son is 18 months, and right now your son is learning a lot of different pro-social skills and gross motor and fine motor skills. And and as he progresses through preschool and the elementary, he's going to shift and he's going to see things and he's going to want to explore. Uh, but you he's are, doing it right now. He's, he's exploring there he is. How to eat. My man, there you go. He can't even eat. Look at him. I'm That's all right. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, and he may look like that in middle school too with the yogurt. It's okay. But you, <laughs> you as a parent yourself, you're going to see, and, and you know, yeah, you have the skill sets because you're an educator to say, look, something's happening, my son. My, my son started out in an activity and whatever the activity is, maybe it's T ball. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, you know, Maybe he doesn't, he's not that good. And he starts to become, you know, kids start to say, hey, you stink, you're this, you're that. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden the child gets withdrawn. And and that's where now it's not only your responsibility, that, you know, to talk to the coach. The coach is certainly responsibility. And, and, and part of the challenge there is a lot of coaches, there's bullying on the playing field. They, again, at the middle and high school end, and they turn their back on kids who are mm -hmm. being victimized. You know, and I, I love movies and I saw a movie on Netflix, which is perfect for this. And it's called Greater. I don't know if you've seen Greater, but if you haven't, it's so powerful about about a, a, a gentleman named Brandon Bosworth who wanted to play for Arkansas, play football. And he mm -hmm. was victimized ever since he was a kid. You got to see it. I won't ruin the plot, but it is all about being bullied. And he achieved this dream of playing at the University of Arkansas, playing football as a walk on. You got to see it. But. You know, your son is going to go through things. And as he progresses through middle, he's going to become withdrawn. Maybe he's going to have a bad day. These, these are red flags. Not to say, you know, you're going to say, hey, son, you know, how was your day at school? If you accept, it's good. And he goes yeah. back to his room. You know, ask some more probing questions. Well, who are your friends? Know their families. Uh, and you can certainly, you have more control in the elementary and middle. 
where you're going to see that shift is when it, they become a freshman and they, they want a little bit more autonomy, you know. Um, but you should know they're, they're, without being invading their personal space, their, their passwords, you know, know what types of apps they're engaged in. And if they. Well, you said something real interesting that I want to ask you about. And obviously, this could be an opinion statement or whatever. When it, you mentioned security and apps, right. what would you say to the parents that say, well, you got two sides of it? Well, they have their own passwords. It's their life or the ones that say, I want to have access to everything so I can check your stuff. I mean, what what do you think? Is there, you know, obviously kids scream, oh, I'm allowed to do, I'm a, you know, American. I got freedom. Like, no, you're a kid. You know, I know that's going to be your your response to that. But what do you say to those parents? Like, how do I justify getting access or should I let them be a kid? Well, you should know, you, Dr. Ray, you know, Daniela, let me tell you something. Her son is 18 years old and he has no authority at all. It, you know, if Daniela says, I need to see your phone, he will turn that phone over because we pay for the phones. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, kids can say whatever they want. Now, here's the peril to that. A lot of kids are going to come home. They're going to be very withdrawn. You, you have to immediately know that there's an issue. If the issue isn't on the physical side of things in the school, and that's where you as an educator slash parent slash coach say, hey, you know, Dr. A, did anything happen in science class today that I need to be aware of? Because, you know, my son Joshua or Julia came home and they were feeling well withdrawn, but they didn't want to talk to me. Yes. And the teacher should communicate back. Yeah, this is what happened. They were, you know, they were excluded at, at play on the playground or someone said something derogatory about them. You know, so there has to be that communication interfacing with the parent and the teacher. Uh, I always tell kids, especially with my teenage daughter, you know, it's very difficult, but we've had multiple issues where she has come to me and said, hey, there's an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's shown me that I don't ask to see her phone. I would never go in because then you violate that privacy right of, of seeing things that perhaps you should not want to see mm-hmm. or she does not want you to see between a boyfriend, girlfriend or, or their own friends. And that's OK. But if I suspect and this is when parents say you have the probability, you know, like in law enforcement, you have that probability or probable cause to suspect something is going on. Mm-hmm. You need to do it. And let me tell you something. If you see a kid, your son or daughter that's gone from a, a, a state of you know, just being withdrawn to euphoria, you need even more so to intervene because that could be compelling case for a potential uh, child to hurt themselves or hurt someone else. And, and, and a lot of information is stored on that iPhone. Wow. Uh, they're of a secret vault, especially to teens. Um, but, you know, it, it, and let me say this, there's no easy answer. No one is a perfect yeah. parent. It, it, it starts with dialogue and conversation and, and saying to kids, you know, don't just settle. And I, we, in our household, the same thing, the kids come home. How was school? Uh, good. That's all you get. Good. No. Well, what happened at track practice? Why aren't you having friends on the weekend? What's going on? You know, wh- wh- where is everybody? Why aren't you? Hang- what, what's, you know, you ask more informative questions. I mean, that's no different than when you teach your subject matter, right? We go from lower, low order thinking to higher order thinking. You want kids to think critically uh, and analyze and synthesize information. It's no different in the cyber world. You want to make sure your kids are safe and protected and you need to do that. Now, if you don't have this and Dr. A, you'll get this, the life 360 on your, on your children's phone. You get wow. that because that tells you a lot where they are, uh, what oh, they're wow. doing. What's the name of that again? It's called life 360. It life is 360. Not, okay. life 360. So it tracks them essentially where they go. And even if, for example, my daughter right now is in the car with her friend, Molly, uh, going to Dairy Queen, I know she's going 45 miles an hour. It actually tracks the speed because wow. the app from yeah, it's great. Life 360. It and you know the kids sometimes say, hey, you know why do you have to track me? They know they turn it off sometimes if they want to sneak out of the house, but it alerts the parents that that Life 360 is off. Why did you turn it off? My mm-hmm. daughter, not the sons. My daughter will tell you, Dad, it drains my battery. Yeah, right. You're just <laughs> turning it off because you don't want me to know you're sneaking out the back door. So. Uh-huh. You know, you, you, you gotta, you gotta monitor that. And you know, you don't want to be certainly the one thing you don't want to do with, especially daughters is, uh, become so intrusive that, that they turn on you. You know, you want to yeah. rely on trust and that starts with that foundation of developing a relationship, just like many of you as educators do every day. Uh, and, and somebody said communication, yeah. is key. whoever said that's absolutely right. It is about dialogue and, and, and engagement, uh, as a family and certainly as an education community. So that kind of leads into the next question here. 
if parents suspect that their child is being cyberbullied or bullied in general, what would you, what would your advice be to like the first step? Yeah. Like, so the first step, and, and this is always a tricky one because somebody's going to say, well, I, I can't talk to the school. No, that's not true. If, if your child is already being harassed and it will happen beginning in age 10 from transitioning to fifth grade into sixth grade, Things will happen online in some media platform. Typically, if, if it's not musically, Instagram or Snapchat, you know, is the notorious one, uh, they will have some dialogue. As soon as someone says that to you, you start the documentation trail. Do not pick up the phone to call your teacher or school principal. You'll start a chain. You will email him or her the details of what your child reported so that you have a paper trail there. Do not call them. Uh, you will document, take screenshots of any texts or uh, correspondence that have come in and out of your phone. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, if you have AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon, there are ways uh, to retain that information so it does not get lost. If the text is deleted, it can be retrieved in certain cases. Same thing with an email. Print it out document that, have the conversation, make an appointment with your school administrator and say, look, I know this happened after hours so that that school administrator, and I've done it many times. I know it happens on Friday or Saturday or Sunday, but I would say, look, I got a report. I know this is happening. You know, don't bring it into school. Or, and, if it, and if it continues, then it may rise to the level of a crime. And we've dealt with that as well, where if it's not our local or state police, if something is harassing in nature and is certainly documented that someone says, I'm going to kill you, I'm mm -hmm. going to hurt you in some way, that is a crime. It is harassment. Uh, so, you know, that can then be used by local law enforcement official to hold somebody accountable. And every municipality is very different. Many, they think it's a joke and they say, well, what do you want me to do with this? This is just nonsense. Kids are playing around and I don't have time for this stuff. But again, believe me, it will turn into something much worse, often very lethal or destructive to a school community or a home. And we don't want that. So it's better safe and sorry and just be proactive. Uh, and, and, you know, the first step, certainly hey, call the parent if you know them. If you don't know them, go through your school, make your guidance counselor your child's teacher and school administrator aware if it continues. And we've often had it continue where they would call me and they'd say, Dr. C, what do I do? I, and parents in our neighboring community is uh, uh, patrolled by the state police. They go to the state police and they will send that documentation. And oftentimes it's a crime. Sometimes it does not raise, uh, it does not rise to the level of a crime, but you, yeah. you're still need to be proactive. I know, I know that you've worked, you've, presented for tens of thousands of students across the country. You yeah. work with families on individual basis when they have issues. What do you say to the parents? Uh, because I've heard people say this before that, oh, so-and-so, or I tried to report bullying and the right. principal didn't do anything or the teacher did. What would you say to people watching this video uh, who hear that? Because I, I know that's, that's not a good thing, but we know the reality is it does happen. Um, and we see the news stories come out where teachers and parents have attempted to do something and nothing was done. So what would you say to people like that? It, it is very discouraging and it happens a lot. And a lot is I hear from parents all the time. I called my son's teacher. I called my son's principal. Nothing happened. So obviously from the perspective of my seat, we get involved, we advocate because unfortunately parents do not know their rights and more so parents when you're dealing with an IEP or a 504 plan, uh, they mm. need to be aware of the safeguards and protecting that child because now you have another another issue if you're violating a child's uh, uh, 504 or IEP. That's a whole nother area. But um, you may need an advocate, you know, and a lot of times it's sad. We have good police. We have bad police. We have good teachers, bad principals, good. Pro I mean, look, we're not perfect human beings. We all make mistakes and use poor judgment. But mm -hmm. I don't believe you should use poor judgment when you have to protect the child. And it is your inherent responsibility to investigate something within a period of 48 hours. Now, unfortunately, in some states, mine, one of them, it may lag, it may lag. You know, in New Jersey, under the Cyber Bullying Act, under HIB, harassment, intimidation, and bullying, you have 48 hours to investigate and deliver a report to the superintendent of schools or your building principal. That is a law in New Jersey, and they take it very seriously. So in New Jersey, just to give you a statistic, last year alone, 12,771 HIB investigations were reported. 
roughly 6,700 were actual bullying issues because teachers, look, they cover their behinds. They're like, I, I don't know, I'm not sure, but I don't want to be held accountable. But mm -hmm. again, I don't know what the reservation is. There's certain people that will say, I have data to look at. I have standardized testing to review. I don't want to deal with something that may be just horseplay. I don't want to deal with something that happened on Snapchat. Let me tell you something, forget the data and forget the, the, the standardized testing. If your child doesn't feel safe or something happens, do that first, because I'm telling you, it, it could be between that and a potential active shooter or a child taking his or her, her own life. We've seen it time and time again. And then you're answering the question, would have, could have, should have. And, uh, you know, it, it's just not good business, especially when, it, when you're in the, the, the business of protecting children. And I definitely urge you, I'll put this up on again on the screen. This is Dr. Cerullo's. This is their Facebook group. Um, if you have any questions or, or, or about personal experiences or something that's going on with your child at school, obviously we're filming this now during the summer of 2020, so they're not physically in school, but definitely the website's on the screen too. Like their page, teachantibullying.org. Um, just search Teach Anti-Bullying right on Facebook. You'll get to their get to their page. Their phone number is on there, their email. They're there for you, their job every single day. And I've known Dr. Cerullo for a while. This is what he he sleeps, eats, and breathes this every day because he wants to look out for our kids uh, in this country and around the world. So what we're going to do here, Dr. Cerullo, is I'm going to ask you, we're, we're, we're about to wrap up here, two things. I want to give you one line something to share with we'll do parents and teachers what's one part of one parting advice that you give to our parents moving forward when it comes to bullying and then we'll do one parting piece of advice for our teachers well for, for parents first of all please don't be naive and think that your child you know never does anything wrong because that that's just not true um i would like for parents to be very supportive and collaboration and collaborative when working with your teachers that is a two-way interface between certainly the teacher and the school administrator and the guidance department it is important so that not only from an academic standpoint uh but certainly from protecting your child from potential harm that there is that open line of communication that that is imperative and and that in that you don't rush to judgment but that you do uh say look i have a concern i, I want to be proactive don't just blame the teacher for not doing what he or she was assigned to do or for the principal that did not you know uh, failed to respond quickly enough you got to give them just like police you got to give them an opportunity to do their jobs and their jobs are very difficult because they're they're inundated with multiple situations daily uh and in some districts are very large even more so so that 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 communication is is essential um certainly for the teachers here's what i say and and, and i'm going to tell you this and, and dr a knows me for over the last nine years um i am noted as one of the best in this country at this when we look at anti-bullying and school violence prevention i've done it and i've done it over for 25 years i i i, I am well versed in this and our license plates say you have a friend in Pennsylvania. My personal site is drclaudiocerullo.com, drclaudiocerullo.com. The nonprofit that Dr. A put up is our nonprofit, but I will respond to teachers. You have a friend in me. You can call me. I'll give you my cell number if you have issues or you want me to interface. I'll be happy to help you. And I, and I say this with respect to Dr. A. That's who I am as an educator. So what I want you to do as teachers is, if you don't know, ask the question. Don't put yourself in harm's way. Don't make a mistake and say, I, I was not aware, especially if you're a first, second, or third year teacher. You're not going to know all the answers. If you struggle, if you need a behavior plan, I could help you with that. Um, or if you're just not sure, just call me. Go to my website. Uh, Dr. A knows my cell number. You guys can call me. I'll be happy to interface. Uh, if you need help with a parent who says, you know, I, I rate parents or you're wrong as a teacher, I'll be happy to help you there too. And I say this, why? Not from the expertise portion, but I never forgot I was a teacher and your job is a very difficult one. Yep. So, so definitely. And I'm going to put, I'll put your contact information in the description of this video yep. too. When we have it up on YouTube, you guys are watching this recording later mm -hmm. on. You can check out below the video. I've got, I'll have all of Dr. Cerullo's contact information. Dr. C, I want to thank you again for spending time with me on a on a Monday evening as we roll into summer here. And who knows what's going to happen when schools are supposed to open up uh, in August or up by you in September. So 
thank you so much. And we'll have people reach out to you if they have any questions. I want to say thank you to you, Dr. A. And I want to also thank all of you wonderful teachers for, for doing a very difficult job in a very uncertain time in our nation. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. C. We'll talk have to you later. Night. All right. So uh, once again, thank you guys for watching as we wrap up here tonight with episode three. Next week, we are going to be talking about how do we virtually engage our students in this new normal. So if you are a teacher uh, or if you know a teacher, you definitely want to tag them uh, on our Learning Liaisons business page or on YouTube channel, share our channel, because we have got another rock star educator coming at you next week on the Deets with Dr. A. So thank you so much. I want you guys to have a great rest of your evening, an even better week, and an even amazing weekend coming up. And we will see you next Monday on Deets with Dr. A, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You guys have a great evening, and we'll talk to you next week.